Hi, everybody. Uh, so this is going to be cardiac surgery part one. So part one is mostly an anatomy review, which you know I don't have to do, but I want to give you guys a little bit more to study with. So you've got some more pictures and different things to study on there. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so you can see my slideshow as I go along. As you know, this is the second part of chapter 22. So you'll see now, hopefully, <laughs> why they separated it into two pieces, because it's such a big chapter, and there's so much to learn in cardiothoracic. So I like how they separated it for you with the thoracic and lung surgery versus the heart surgery on this one. So I'll go ahead and get started. So I'm on page 1029. So it goes through in the introduction all the surgeries that you're going to see in this chapter, but I want you to look down at that third paragraph. So it starts talking about these patients in general, heart patients. So these are always going to be ICU patients. Because of that, they're going to have lots of extra monitoring lines in place, and they're going to have to be more involved than they are with other patients. So you can see that they'll be in an ICU bed, but I want to point out what it says at the top of that third paragraph. So I'm going to read it for you. Occasionally, the patient will be brought over from cardiac cath lab, usually for an emergent procedure. So what it's talking about is if they take a patient to the cardiac cath lab, a scheduled procedure, like putting in a stent maybe. While they're trying to put in that stent, it could dissect the vessel. It could make it worse, basically. So when that happens, that bleeding can't be stopped other than opening it up and doing surgery. So they are going to have to bring the patient to the OR and quickly open up so that we can fix that surgically. So if you look at the other side of the same page, you'll see that they have the cardiac team on standby or sometimes on call if they are uh, doing a procedure in the cath lab. So it's for this exact reason. So if they're in the cath lab um, trying to do an angioplasty on a patient, and they know that they, this could go badly, then that heart team is gonna be available in the OR so they can quickly open and get ready for a case. So that is why that is on there. I'm gonna point out another thing for you. So it tells you these emergencies require you to open very quickly, and often as the patient is being moved from the gurney to the OR table. So because of this, these patients just came from the cardiac cath lab, right? So you've already learned in peripheral vascular surgery that they're gonna use the femoral artery most of the time. So they have all these extra lines coming out of them, their ICU patients, and then when you go to move them over from the stretcher or gurney to the OR table, that line could get pulled out. So you get to hear the horror story that I got to see. So I saw this happen to somebody, and it was a scrub tech. Luckily, they were not the person scrubbed in for the case, they were just in the room helping out as I was. So we moved the patient over, they didn't see the femoral line, they didn't look for it, and it pulled out. The surgeon had the script tech put pressure on the femoral artery for 10 minutes, that is protocol. So when they pull the sheath out, when they're done with it, that's protocol. They hold with a lap for 10 minutes, hard pressure. So we had to proceed with this emergency case. So this scrub tech was under the drapes, non-sterile, holding pressure on this femoral artery as they were doing the cardiac procedure. So that is why you do not want to pull out this femoral sheath. So now you've got a horror story, so that will never happen to you. You'll look out for that sheath. Okay, let's get into the anatomy and physiology. So I'm on page 1030. So anatomy and physiology. Know all of the details in your book. So everything about the details of the location of the heart, not just that it's mostly on the left side, all the details, like it lies diagonally with the distal apex tapering to the left, those kinds of details you need to know. After that, I get into the coverings of the heart. As you can see, there's a really good picture I've added on here for you. So make sure you separate the fibrous versus the serous pericardium and know that there's that serous, um, fluid in that pericardial cavity. So looking at your serous pericardium, know that there's two layers you're looking for, parietal and visceral. We already know those terms. We know visceral covers the organ, but you need to know the difference between the two and that there's that pericardial space in between that is filled with that serous fluid. After that, I get into the heart wall. 
So this picture has the heart wall, all three layers, epicardium, your outer layer, myocardium, the muscle thick layer, and endocardium, the inner layer. This picture also has all of the chambers. Hopefully you remember that the atrias are on top and the ventricles are in the bottom. So it's kind of like alphabetical order for you, A at the top, B at the bottom. Um, as you're looking through your uh, chambers, you should also be learning your heart valves. So let me stop for just a second at the heart chambers. So we know there's two atrias and two ventricles. I want you to also know where the blood is going, where it's coming from as you're reading through this. So in the atria, it's gonna be receiving the blood from the veins of the body. And in the ventricles, you're gonna be pumping the blood into the arteries leading away from the heart. So I will go through the blood flow of the heart, a little review, but you should definitely remember that from anatomy and physiology. Now we can look at your heart valves. So make sure you know all of your heart valves and the multiple names. So the first one you're gonna encounter is that tricuspid valve. So remember it's tri for three, because it's got uh, three little cusps on it, leaf-like cusps on it that you can see. So your tricuspid valve, and then the next one you're gonna see is your pulmonary semilunar valve. You know, if it has the word pulmonary in it, it's gotta be going to, toward the lungs to get that oxygen. So pulmonary semilunar valve. Then the mitral valve, we all know that as bicuspid valve. So bicuspid, um, two valves. <clears throat> um, after that, you need to look for the aortic semilunar valve. And after that, it starts getting into the extra anatomy. So it's talking about the heart strings of your heart. So the chordae tendinae in your heart. So I want you to know for this part what they actually do. So they prevent the cusps of the valve from folding back into the atrium. That actually brings me to the blood flow of the heart. So you can see more detailed pictures of the valves here for you to study, but let's go into the blood flow of the heart. So if you don't remember it, I'll go through it with you one last time. So I'm gonna try to not actually look at your book but if I were you, I would number this or go look at your old notes so that you can do it without even looking at the book. Because you definitely want to know the blood flow of the heart by heart now so that you can really start studying procedures. Because think about when it comes time to cramming for the CST. Well, number one, you don't want to be cramming, but <laughs> you want to be studying procedures, right? Not the blood flow of the heart. You should already know that. So make sure you commit this to memory if you haven't already. So I like this picture, but there's many more online. If you don't like it, find another one. But you can see it's gonna start from the two veins. So superior and inferior vena cava, the blood's gonna rush into that right atrium. Remember, we always do A before B, so atrium's first. Superior inferior vena cava meets in the right atrium. So after the right atrium, it's gonna flow down through that valve into the right ventricle. Ventricles are always going to contract and push the blood up. So from that right ventricle, it's going to go through that valve into the pulmonary artery. Pulmonary artery is going to push that blood all the way to the lungs to get that oxygen. Now that we have oxygen, oxygenated blood, it's going to come in through those pulmonary veins. So see where it says from the lung, from the pulmonary veins. So then we're going through another valve that sorry, pulmonary vein into the left atrium, then we get through another valve into the left ventricle. So remember A before B again, we went left atrium, left ventricle, and from the ventricle, it's going to contract and shoot that blood up again. So left ventricle contracts, we go through that aortic valve, and we know if it's an aortic valve, it's going into the aorta. So from there, it goes to the aorta, and the blood goes to the rest of your body. So there is the blood flow of the heart review for you. Um, as you are looking through this, look at the details. So I just went through with all of the chambers, right? I told you with it, which uh, atrium and ventricle, you also need to know the names of all the valves as you go through it. I said a couple of them for you, but can't give it all away. Make sure you study that blood flow of the heart. I just went through adding the names of the valves as you go. With that and what is in your book, you should know everything you need to know for your exam and for your CST for the heart. So after that, I go to blood supply for the heart. So this is talking about your coronary arteries. So you need to know where they originate from, 
and you can see that it originates from your ascending aorta. And then you need to know the more details that are in your book. So know your right and left coronary artery and then some of the branches after that. So you can see some of the branches in this picture. I just need you to know the ones that are in your book. So all the artery branches that are in your book. You can see on this next slide, it talks about the veins, but it doesn't get into a lot of detail. So this is your reminder for any time you hear the word sinus, and we're talking about vascular things. I'm not talking about a sinus in your nose, right? We're talking about this big vessel. So when it says coronary sinus, that's the main biggest part of the vessel um, on the heart. So that's your coronary sinus, um, and you need to read that last bullet point about uh, blood supply, including the veins, not just the arteries. Okay, that brings me to cardiac conduction. So there's a couple different ways to study this, but you can look at the order in both of these pictures and your book and kind of run your way through it. You should know it just like you know the blood flow of the heart. So I'll try to simplify it and go through the pathway here with you. So our, if you want to make notes with this, I'll tell you when to make them when we get to the node. So we're starting at the SA node, right? So that's where the impulse is generated. So that's what nodes you can add here. So the SA node, your pacemaker of the heart is gonna generate the impulse. So that's why they call it the pacemaker of the heart. It's generating the impulse. So as that pacemaker is doing its job, generating the impulse. Basically, it's trying to make a pathway between the atrium and the ventricles so that whenever the heart contracts, it can contract as a full unit. So you'll see it needs to connect to the AV node. So after the SA node, it's gonna to go to the AV node. Here is where it's actually going to take a pause. The impulse is going to take a pause. It tells you exactly why um, in your book, this allows time for the atria to empty the blood into the ventricles. But the part you need to know is the order and when things happen. So SA node number one, number two goes to the AV node and pauses. Number three, now that we have that uh, pathway between the atrium and the ventricles, number three is gonna be your bundle of his or your AV bundle. So at your AV bundle, it's gonna connect the atria to the ventricles, as I said. So the only electrical connection between the atria and the ventricles is this bundle of his or the AV bundle. It enters at the upper portion of the interventricular septum, as you can see. So after the AV bundle, it's going to go to the bundle branches to conduct the impulses through that interventricular septum that I was talking about. So from there, it's going to go to the bundle branches. So find in your book where it says, it talks about the interventricular septum dividing, and then it talks about the left and right bundle branches that travel along that septum all the way down to the apex. After that, your next place that's going is the perjunky fibers. So this stimulates the contractile cells of both ventricles, and this is what results in a contraction. So your perjunky fibers is your last step resulting in a contraction. Your book says resulting in the contraction of the ventricle of both ventricles. So you can add that note in also. Okay, after that, what's not on your slideshow is everything about the nervous system divisions. This is something you need to go and review and study. So you'll see the book separates it for you and remind, reminds you parasympathetic and sympathetic division. What you need to study is basically which one is going to help accelerate the heart rate and heart contractions and which one is going to be responsible for slowing down the heart rate. So it goes into, in the parasympathetic division, how these fibers are actually originating in your brain and the brainstem, in the medulla oblongata. So it originates in your brainstem, then it turns into your vagus nerve, and then it terminates, it ends in your heart, your SA and your AV nodes. So you see, I want you to see this connection with the nerve fibers and the electrical impulse for your heart. So make sure you're studying more than just what's in your book about the nervous system and how that affects the cardiac conduction cycle. Okay, that brings me into diagnostic. 
So diagnostic imaging, you know, I like to give you a picture of everything labeled like I did for thoracics. Are you going to be tested on being able to label this chest x-ray? No, you're not still, but this is going to help you understand the anatomy better so you can have a conversation with these surgeons during the cases and better understand what's going on. So for your diagnostic procedures, um, what's not on my slideshow is echocardiography, electrocardiography, and many other diagnostic procedures that they can do that are not invasive. The ones that are invasive, I included on here. So you can see chest x-ray, every patient's gonna get a chest x-ray, AP and lateral usually. And then after that, if you read down, I'm on page 1033. If you'll read down, you'll see the differences and what they're going to do CT and MRIs for. So CTs and MRIs are useful for evaluation of heart masses. And then it separates it further after that. So CTs are especially good for thoracic aorta dissection and MRIs are better for detecting abnormal positioning of intracardiac structures. So something abnormally placed in the heart that should be somewhere else, you're gonna see that on an MRI. So know the difference between those. And then what's not in your book. So it gets to cardiac catheterization and all the different studies they can do in there. What I need you to add is cardiac catheterization provides the most extensive details for valve disorders. So anything that has to do with heart valve, they're gonna do cardiac catheterization to diagnose, to check it out. So uh, one more time, pointing this detail out. So your book nicely in diagnostic procedures and tests says these cardiac catheterization cases could be done in interventional radiology. I've told you guys this, interventional radiology, better known as IR. The other term for that is the angio suite. Another term for that is the cardiac cath lab. So I'm throwing all the names at you. So no matter where you're at, you will know what they're talking about, regardless of which term they use talking about the cardiac cath lab. But honestly, if you hear them talking about doing a stent or a coil or anything percutaneous, that's where they're doing it. You just need to think, what do I need to have ready if we go open in the OR? So cardiac cath lab, uh, let's do one more that's not in your book. So, or sorry, not on my slideshow. On 1033 at the last section of diagnostic procedures and tests, it's reminding you for anesthesia what all is involved for them. So for the anesthesia provider, they should examine the pre-op pulmonary function, coagulation studies, and arterial blood gas studies, because they're gonna be a lot more involved with these patients than they are with other surgeries. Okay, routine instruments, equipment, and supplies. So I'm gonna go into instrumentation. You can see on this picture, there's a lot of instrumentation. So I added one that has the cardiac sets so that you can see some of these different retractors, but they are all in your orange book. So you need to get in your orange book and go through the rest of your cardiac instruments. Because I already went through all of the instruments in your orange book with you, I'm not gonna go back through that with you. What you need to do are look for specific things. For instance, your Dietrich scissors that are listed here in your cardiac tray. These are small microvascular scissors that if you look at the micro instruments in your orange book, you will see scissors that are very similar. So even though it might not have that exact scissor, you'll see a microsurgical scissor that's very circumflexed and turned around and it's gonna be doing the same job. So they're going to have, let me give you the whole list, something to do a thoracic procedure, right? So we're going to need a sternal saw and a sternal retractor to get into the chest. From there, it could get more involved with the retractors, and you can look at those in your book. It was right next to your rib spreader. It had the valvular retractors that are pictured right here. So basically, the retractor gets more involved depending on how involved your heart case is. So you can pick out the right retractor to go with your specific case, but you gotta find that in the orange book. So even though I'm not going through it, that does not mean that you don't need to. It means you need to get in that orange book and go through the details. So after that, let's look at your book for a moment. So it's telling you at the beginning of instrumentation, coronary bypass procedures, they're going to have to expose the heart, have instruments for the great vessels of the heart, have instruments to cannulize, to do cardiopulmonary bypass, 
You have to have instruments for saphenous vein harvesting, coronary anastomosis, that's all your microvascular instruments, and Dietrich instrument tray, more small instruments. So let's keep going. Sternal saw, sternal retractor, and possibly the IMA retractor. Valve retractors, sizers for aortic or micro valves. That's a lot of stuff, right? So that's why you'll see as you're reading, they want you to be an experienced scrub before you get onto the heart team. Because you want to be a well-rounded scrub, number one. Number two, you want to know how to do other cases and have a good idea of surgery in general before jumping into cardiac surgery. It's much more involved, there's more instruments to count, just bigger procedure all around, and your patients are sicker. They're ICU patients, they're more likely to be lost um, on the table, which almost never happens in surgery, but a heart scrub tech is more likely to see something like that. So that's why it's so involved. So I've listed everything your book listed for you. What I want you to know is what I just told you, all the stuff to open the sternum, and then on top of that, vascular clamps. On top of that, all the micro stuff to do the anastomoses and the repair. So the way I would think of it is it's, you know, biggest to smallest. That's kind of how I feel about neurosurgery because it's the same idea. We still need a big drill and everything to get in and bigger tractors, but then once we get in there, we need all these little tiny micro instruments to do the actual work to do the repair. So they have similarities. So after your instrumentation, you'll see I have more in this picture. So this picture is not only for supplies, it's for instruments too. So find the instruments that you already know and review on them, because a lot of these instruments are review, right? I told you peripheral vascular and thoracic pulmonary bleeds into heart surgery. So this should mostly be review for you. You should definitely review everything I taught you about chest tubes because I will not be going over that on this chapter, only because I taught it all to you last chapter, because I have a plan and I wanted to teach you bypass and chest tubes in the last chapter so you'd have less to learn this week. So <clears throat> that brings me right into equipment and everything you see listed on this page. So for equipment, you need to know all of those bullet points, every single one of them where it says defibrillator unit, they usually have this in the heart room. We had a crash cart that lived in the heart room. But if you're not in that situation, you need to make sure that a defibrillator is very close by and ready to go. Um, after that, you can read through all the different equipment you'll need. Hopefully you see uh, things that are very similar to what we've learned in thoracic surgery. Okay, that brings me to the supplies that you see on your slide here. So supplies that you should already recognize, the suture, we've got double-armed proline sutures. I see little white squares, which are pledgets to thread onto those. I see shods to uh, clamp onto our sutures. I see lots of hemoclips, lots of different sized blades. I see a bovie extender tip. There's lots more up there, but I want you to go through and see what you recognize. Uh, so what is review for you on here? Okay, now specific to cardiac surgery. So pacemaker, this one it mentions in your equipment, but I know you guys haven't seen it before. So this is what your pacemaker actually looks like along with the wire leads that go with it. The next picture are your cannulas that you'll be inserting for bypass. So even though we learned bypass last week, I will be going over some details and now I got the arrow pointing at those uh, cannulas so you can see what the cannulas are going to look like that we're going to put inside the heart so that we can go on bypass. And then lastly, I have your defibrillator on the heart in here. So this is your internal defibrillator. So you guys probably have not seen that one before. So this usually is attached to the crash cart also, but this could be a secondary item that is blue wrapped. So for a lot of heart cases, you will open this and have it open and ready to go. So it's not a thing of, oh, we need it now, open it, it's already open. All they have to do is say clear and have everybody not touch the patient before we shock the patient. Okay, so that's some more of your equipment and supplies. Remember, I did the specific cardiac surgery supplies, the rest of it should be review for you for sure. 
especially the chest tubes. Okay, so that brings me to cardiopulmonary bypass. So you've already learned it, you've watched the video, you understand what's happening, I hope. If you don't, you should go back to last week, watch those YouTube videos and really understand the heart-lung machine. So first of all, you're gonna learn in your book that it's called a pump oxygenator. I want you to know both terms. So pump oxygenator, AKA heart-lung machine. So I want you to know overall what it's doing. So it's going to remove the unoxygenated blood from the venous system and oxygenate and filter it and return it through the arterial system. So in general, you should already know this part, but it allows the lungs to be deflated for better exposure of the heart. Not to mention the heart isn't beating during the procedure. It's much easier to work on. As you'll see, if you keep reading, we do uh, surgery on hearts that are still beating and it's much harder to work on because of that. So it's the whole point is to get the heart to stop beating so it'll stop moving and we can work on it. Mm. All right, so if you keep reading, it goes a little further down. I want you to read the part about oxygenating the blood. So the heart lung machine um, is going to produce what's called extracorporeal circulation. The oxygen of the blood replacing the function of the lungs and the pumping of the blood replacing the function of the heart. So you'll see well, how it's replacing both functions at the same time. The, the pump oxygenator is what's gonna talk about next and where the cannulas are gonna go. So venous blood is gonna be removed from the body with these cannulas that's placed into the right atrium of the vena cava. That's just to start with. After that, it talks about manipulating temperature as needed throughout the case. So I want you to find the part where it says roller pump. Roller pump, and that's in your picture also, the cardiopulmonary bypass. So the temperature of the blood um, can be manipulated as needed. After the blood has been oxygenated, this roller pump is gonna move the blood from the reservoir back into the arterial system. That is one part that you need to know. After that, these pumps are used for removing the blood in the operated site using cardiotomy suckers. So is this a regular suction tubing? No, it's telling you exactly what it's going to do. So cardiotomy suckers are different than a regular suction tube. So the cardiotomy suckers are going to get that vented blood from the left ventricle. So after that, this blood, Sorry, this blood is added to the reservoir for oxygenization and sent back into the arterial system. The placement of the cannula into the right atrium is gonna be for draining the venous blood. So when it tells you in your book your different options, right atrium versus vena cava, I want you to focus on the right atrium. Yes, you need to know both, but typically they're gonna go for right atrium if they can. And as you read, you'll see why in all the details. Um, after that, uh, sorry, right atrium for draining that venous blood. So after that, it goes to the pump oxygenator and the ascending aorta for the return of arterial blood from the pump oxygenator. So this whole process is called cannulization. So putting these cannulas into the heart so that it, we can use the cardiopulmonary bypass machine is cannulation. Uh, it tells you next, I'm on page 1036 now, it tells you next what they're going to do to prevent clotting for these patients. So before this cannulization happens, we are going to heparinize the patient. So we're going to give heparin um, administered by anesthesia. That's going to tell you what happens after the cannulization. So after venous and arterial cannulization, we're going to have some more tubing from the pump oxygenator and it's going to be attached to the cannula. So this is extra tubing that's going to be put into the heart. From here, the connectors between the pump lines and the arterial cannulas are made and they're going to take care to make sure that there's no air bubbles inside. We don't want to put air into our circulatory system, right? We only want to put blood. So they're going to be looking for bubbles and preventing air bubbles from getting into that bypass circuit. 
Okay, so as you're studying this, you need to know both techniques. So the technique for aortic cannulization and the technique for venous cannulization. Uh, the other thing you need to know is the left ventricle vent placement um, into the left atrium. So we've got three different techniques that you need to learn here, and I'll tell you the important parts that you need to study. So let's start with aortic cannulization. So the aorta is exposed. We're going to put a purse string suture in, placed high on the ascending aorta. This is just going to allow room for the grafts and the venting cannula. After that, and I'm leaving out lots of details, after that we're going to cut those needles out of the way and we're going to apply that Satinsky aorta clamp to the aorta. After that we're going to make an incision, an arteriotomy into the aorta and that's going to be right in between those purse string sutures. After they get everything where they would like it and then the cannula is allowed to fill with that arterial blood, <clears throat> then we're going to hold that cannula in place. So the cannula is going to be held in place by rubber catheters or tourniquets. A lot of times they just call these keepers, just like it says in your book. A heavy silk suture is going to be tied around these cannulas or rubber keepers to make sure that they stay in the place. So that's your aortic cannulization. Let's look at venous cannulization. So very similar process. Note what is different. So I'm going to start with what's different. Number one, a single purse string suture is placed into the right atrial appendage. So instead of a double purse string like we did with the aortic cannula, we're doing a single purse string. You do need to know that. These needles are still going to be removed in the same manner. We're still going to place that Satinsky clamp in the same manner and place our venous cannula this time. So that venous cannula is going to drain the blood from that right atrium and inferior vena cava and all of the veins. We're still going to apply a heavy silk suture around that cannula or the rubber keepers to keep it into place. After that, we're gonna talk about left ventricle vent placement through the left atrium, very specific. This one is going to be a single purse string suture also. The small incision is gonna be made into the pulmonary vein this time. And this one is going to be a venting catheter. So it is a different type of catheter. It's not a cannula. So a 20 French left heart venting catheter is inserted and guided into the left ventricle. The venting catheter is attached to suction line from the pump oxygenator. So everything's going to be connected to that pump oxygenator. What you can add underneath this left ventricle vent placement is the purpose of it. So this is going to be reducing the metabolic needs of the heart during the surgery. So that's why we do left ventricle vent placement. You can see more about the vent placement at the top of 1036. So it talks about for optimal visualization during coronary artery bypass procedures, left ventric ventricle venting is accomplished with the cannula, placed um, into that left ventricle. So this allows them to insert that cardioplasia solution administered through the aortic puncture site. Okay, that's the beginning of <laughs> all your different cannulas for cardiopulmonary bypass. Lots of detail there. So I especially like this picture because you can see where they're actually gonna put the aortic cross clamp where the venous cannula is gonna go and where the arterial cannula is gonna go. So hopefully the combo of this picture, the videos you watched last week, and this picture, now you really understand what's happening in bypass. So let's look at what it says in your book on 1037. So myocardial protection during bypass is accomplished with systemic hypothermia. So it's telling you we're going to cool the patient way down in addition to doing all of this with the heart-lung machine. Okay, so hypothermia reduces the oxygen demands of the myocardium, that heart muscle. So this technique is utilized most often for cardiac procedures. After cannulization and starting bypass, a Fogarty cross clamp is placed across the ascending aorta. So that's what you see in this picture, right where it says cross clamp and there's a big X. That's where we're placing our uh, cross clamp over the aorta. 
they are going to start administering that cardioplasia solution at this time. So it's very cold and it's going to inhibit myocardial contraction and a paralyzing solution. So it is paralyzing the heart and stopping it from beating. That's what that cardioplasia solution is going to do. So after that, it talks about specifically retrograde. So that is pictured right here on the slide. So retrograde administration of cardioplasia is useful for second operations, for coronary artery stenosis or for valvular procedures. So all of these decisions are made up by, are made by the surgeon. So they know more details about this and all of the anatomy. So they are going to decide whether there needs to be retrograde um, or antegrade on this administration of the cardioplasia solution. But it's a cold solution that we're putting into the heart to uh, basically start systemic hypothermia. So after you read about retrograde administration, go to your next paragraph. It talks about what you need for cardioplasia infusion as the script text. So you'll need ice slush or ice cold saline, and we're gonna place this around the heart. So any scrub, even students who have worked in the heart room know that we keep cold solution around the heart. Because a lot of times during a cabbage as a student, that will be your job is simply holding the heart. So as they do their anastomosis and sew on the heart, they, if they have a student in the room, they'll have the student hold the heart. Because all you're doing is holding the heart still. The hardest part for me was it's ice cold, literally, because we got ice on it. So it was just being very still and not moving a muscle even though in your mind you're shivering because you're so cold. But yes, we'll place ice around the heart. Some not, sometimes that can be with a ice cold lap, so you can make that note in there. So the whole purpose of this is at the end of that paragraph. So this is gonna reduce the oxygen demand on the myocardium of the heart by half. So we need half as much, much oxygen as before. So this allows us to stay on cardiopulmonary bypass and do these procedures. So there is your bypass with all the details. And again, you can go back and watch those YouTube videos if you want more details on bypass surgery. So that brings me into the pathology. This is the end of my slide. So uh, cabbage pathology. So I'll go through a couple of these and then tomorrow I'll start with your cabbage procedure. So coronary artery bypass graft, everybody better know that that's a cabbage by now. So <laughs> know what these cases are for, know the pathology behind it. So all these risk factors are on your slide for you so you can see some of the risk factors. Know everything that's listed in your book. I will go through a couple. So age, gender, race, genetics, hypertension, cigarette smoking, very uh, high on the list of pathology of risk factors for coronary atherosclerosis. So look at your term atherosclerosis. So I put this picture on here so you can see the different stages of the plaque formation basically of this uh, atheroma forming inside of the vessels. But it talks about this through a couple different pages so make sure you read it all. So atherosclerosis describes this condition that involves the formation of the althroma. You need to know the order. I only put step one on here for you so you can study all the other steps. But step one is going to start with injury to the endothelial lining of the arterial wall. So you can see on your slide here it says endothelial dysfunction. So it's starting to form on that um, wall and protrude out. So there's a good picture in your book also on 1039. So you can see the next steps of the formation and what happens next. Well, in fact, look at that page, 1039. So I want you to know what this links with. So progressive chronic myocardial ischemia is your underlying pathogenic mechanism for coronary atherosclerosis. I knew I would mess it up at least once for you. <laughs> so for your studying, know that this ischemia is responsible for the clinical manifestations of coronary atherosclerosis. So it gives you a long list, but I, that's the part I want you to focus on. After that, it says acute MI, myocardial infarction, 
which results in death of the heart tissue and sudden cardiac death. So don't forget myocardial infarction, MI, is a heart attack, and this results in death of a portion of the heart tissue. So basically, this plaque can cause stenosis, can cause the blood from not pumping as it normally should, and could eventually cause death of cardiac tissue. So that's what you need to think about as you're reading through this. So read all the details, know what you need to know for the test, but I want you to understand the bigger picture of what's really going on with this pathology. All right, so let's read one more down after that. So what I was just talking about, sudden occlusion of a vessel. So this could be from this plaque forming. Sudden occlusion of a vessel results in acute myocardial infarction, a heart attack, and treatment must be immediate. So this patient just had a heart attack and the treatment must be immediate. The area of damage um, from the heart attack depends on the coronary artery affected and the amount of myocardial tissue severed by the artery. So basically it all depends on how bad the heart attack was. If you'll flip it over to page 1040, I go into the coronary artery lesions. Perfect. So this slide is actually perfect for what I was just saying, the myocardial ischemia. So you can see the rupture in the vessel wall and then where the actual blood clot was and how this can, um, and how this is your underlying mechanism of coronary atherosclerosis. Okay, now I wanna look at your coronary artery lesions on your next page. So coronary artery lesions, for your studying, you need to know where they usually occur. What your book left out is basically how they decide what to do with these lesions. So what I wanted you to see is how they decide how to manage it. So how did they decide whether to do a stent or a cabbage or drug therapy or tell them to modify their lives? So now you can see that on the slide. So you can see stenotic or non-stenotic infarction versus ischemia makes a huge difference in them deciding how to treat these lesions. But yes, you can treat these lesions many different ways. I think that was one of the questions I got during thoracic or peripheral vascular surgery. It was saying, can we treat coronary artery lesions in the cath lab? Yes, absolutely. You can go try to put a stent in or some other uh, revascularization technique. So yes, we can try to do these minimally invasive. If we can't, we'll do open heart surgery at cabbage. So page 1040, coronary artery lesions usually occur near the origin and bifurcation of the main coronary vessels. So it goes into more details after that, and you do need to know those. So it talks about LAD, which is left anterior descending. So that's very specific. That accounts for 50% of these lesions in the coronary system. In the right coronary artery, it accounts for 30 to 40%. In that circumflex branch on the left coronary uh, system, it accounts for 15 to 20%. So all these percentages are different depending on where it is, and you do need to know that information. Okay, after that, it talks about myocardial rupture. So find that part on your page. Myocardial rupture is also known as cardiac tamponade. So cardiac tamponade, so we've got a uh, Fluid built up in the heart. So cardiac tamponade, because it's fluid, is usually going to be treated by pericardiocentesis. So we're cutting into the pericardium of the heart. This is a potential, uh, potentially lethal condition, and it's also known as a myocardial rupture, as I said. So we have fluid built up in that pericardial sac, and it's going to put pressure on that heart. So this could stop it from pumping as it should. So we have to get in there and release that fluid so that the heart can pump normally. After cardiac tamponade, it talks about cardiac aneurysm. So a cardiac aneurysm could be formed by massive heart attacks, by massive MIs. Heart failure and cardiogenic shock um, as a result of inadequate perfusion of the tissues 
and multi-system organ failure may also develop. It goes into all the different things that can develop after this cardiac aneurysm. On top of that, you could have cerebral ischemia, irreversible drain, brain damage, and it could also affect your kidneys. They're most often damaged. So cardiac tamponade or myocardial rupture has a huge impact on your body. So it's not just a pathology for cabbage. So cardiac tamponade, make sure you understand what that is and how we're going to treat it. And that is the end of my pathology for cardiac surgery. So tomorrow I'm gonna to start on the cabbage and I'm gonna do all of adult cardiac surgery. And then on Wednesday, I will save that for the uh, pediatric cardiac surgery. So I will separate this into all three days because it is a big chapter, even though it's only part of a chapter. So if you have any questions, please comment underneath and I will make a post actually so that everybody can participate with some comments this week. So let me know if you have any questions. I'm here to help you guys. Talk to you soon. Bye.